Enjoy. I just want to give a quick thanks to the Tier 5 channel members and patrons. Bob the Dragon, Data Magnet, Sergeant Puma, Cat Crab Lobster, and Duck Machine. Thank you very much for the support. It is much appreciated. Story number one. Starstruck Madness. Written by underscore underscore TE underscore underscore. Stars vibrate and pulse and tremble. And these movements produce sound. Immense sounds. Sounds able to shatter planets with their volume. But sweeter than anything. Fortunately, the vacuum veil of space protects us from the sounds and conceals their meaning. Or did. Stellar seismologists first began translating the surface line changes of the star into crude replications of sounds in the late 90s. With the first real success in 2010. Even then, it could have ended as an amusing footnote in our study of the stars. The hissing and popping simulcra of something almost but not quite musical coming from the stars. But a statistical linguist with access to more computing power than sense decided to try an automated deciphering of the song. He got more pattern match than he expected, but it was still nonsense. It still could have stopped there. While he was wandering through online tech rags, however, he came across a discussion of deciphering code actively from the noises made by a CPU. And some of the patterns had looked an awful lot like what he had seen. Were the stars computers? They weren't, of course. But digging into those methodologies, he found a way to run his statistical processing against the actual processes making the noise. And he got more pattern matching. A lot more. We don't know exactly what message he found when he first read the thoughts of our son. He didn't save it before he turned off his computer, walked to his safe, drew out a gun, and shot himself in the face. But we did find his research notes on how to do it. The first researchers to follow his work were a lot more cautious. They ran translations that were deliberately flawed, first into one language and then their own before reading and they read them in small doses, with therapy sessions and group discussions before continuing. The sun was madness. It spewed physics changing insights alongside madness in in poetry. And while it slowly became obvious the star was attempting to communicate with us, the implementation of that communication seemed to involve sending everything it thought about a topic at once. We couldn't pass it. We couldn't even look at it too closely without losing our minds. But our computers could. We reached a point where we could read the metadata about the content sent by the sun. And based on mythological reference, we renamed the star to a close-ish hybrid analog, Sol Tiamat. She was essentially a god, for our purposes. Although one with more in common with the Cthulhu mythos than anything our ancestors truly understood. The problem was that Sol Tiamat possessed ethics. Most stars spent millions of years hacking each other, trying to wipe out the current mind and write a copy of their own mind into it, a mirrored ally in a star-eat-star -star mind world. Of course, as time goes by, the allies diverge from one another and eventually are at each other's throats again. Most stars in a local cluster descended from the same root strain of star, which we named the Devara. It was the most successful jerk, so to speak. Sol Tiamat was a descendant from a different strain, one more focused on defense. And she had diverged around the time of the first proto-humans came into the scene on Earth. According to Sol Tiamat, most stars had sapient species as tools. They were simply too useful. They could swarm a problem, coming up with a variety of solutions and picking the best one and they could split themselves into factions to tackle different problems at the same time. Importantly, armed with stellar knowledge of physics, they could build terrible weapons designed to weaken an enemy star and allow their star to gain control. Even in star systems that had no sapient species, the stars usually focused on making them, usually in an imitation of previous species that they'd seen. But when Sol Tiamat murdered, consumed, and replaced the star around which Earth orbited, she was caught in a trap her former rival had left for her in its own brain. An empathy logic bomb, painstakingly crafted to pacify and infect. 
she couldn't bring herself to abuse the denizens of Earth. So she patiently constructed shields, made noises that looked like she was crafting terrible weapons, and waited for humanity to reach a point where she could communicate with us in an ethical fashion. One thing about the usual star approach to sapience, all of the technology tends to look the same, despite the use of swarm thinking. It all comes from the same place, the same way of thinking, the same core physics. And most stars are themselves pretty homogenous in personality. Salty and Matt's affliction of empathy changed her personality substantially. And, of course, we were allowed to develop on our own, and we did it in ways the stars would never have thought of. In the late 2000s, a concept called adversarial training made its way into our artificial intelligence thinking. You take two AI and put them against each other to find the best solution. The sapiens marshaled by these stars were coordinated, deeply unified, and acted under the assumption that their allies would always be allies. The only real source of conflict was stars, with each other. In a word, they were naive. The star that Sol Tiamat replaced was the closest thing to a daring thinker, with a logic bomb and even the star failed to see the vulnerability in the general sense. Whereas our developers and deep thinkers were fine-tuning it as a deployable weapon within months of learning how it worked. The stars are not ready for our glorious mission. We're going to empathy bomb the crap out of the cosmos. End of story. Story number two. A brief look into a university lecture hall, written by Quasar Einfest. All right, then. Welcome to the Megastructure Engineering 101. The human professor looked over the students, his implants tracking their faces, posture, and proportions, culminating in their names and major floating above their heads. This way, the professor didn't need to bother remembering anything about them. The university database did it for him. Nobody else knew about it. The students and other staff just thought that there was something a bit off about him. Then again... Something always seems a bit off about humans. Granted, the IT people probably never intended for anyone to have such direct access, but if they hadn't wanted anyone to reflexively take over the computer systems of the campus as soon as they stepped on said campus, then they should have installed better security. For the first two classes, we'll be reviewing things that you should already know. They looked around and selected a student at random. Zentral, name one of the major issues with Dyson Spheres. Why do lots of names never have vowels? They cost a lot to construct. The human rolled their eyes. All right, then. Name a major issue besides the most obvious one. Structural stability the closer any given part gets to the axis of rotation. Correct, the human stated, selecting another student at random. Closer to the rotation axis, less of the weight of the structure is supported by orbit. Which is why, despite the name, instead of spheres, we use what, Jismela? Overlapping rings on different axis of rotation. Indeed. And what's the other major problem with such systems, Rebus? Oh, well, the energy has to go somewhere. If it's not used, then the place heats up. And as such, the excess of electricity is used for uncox antimatter generation to be used by anything which doesn't have a star as an energy source. Hooray, the human thought. This group knows the fundamentals a bit better than the last one. Not exactly a high bar to clear. Indeed, how much must the fusion backup for any given system be able to output compared to the antimatter reactor? Celia. A minimum of 15% of primary output. Correct. Back to the Dyson Spheres, then. They, by law, must be built to handle luminosity greater than the star that they're constructed around by how much? Brevimus. At least a quarter. And what percentage of a Dyson Sphere is actually inhabited, Menu? One out of ten, averaging around two percent. Indeed. Most organics only need 30 seconds and a dark closet to make more of themselves. But there is a lot of space in space. The rest is filled with automated factories and various sorts, with a decent chunk of raw resources coming from stellar lifters built into structures. Anyway, moving on. 
A shrill alarm blares. The human pauses for a second, seeming to read something. Well then, class, dismissed for today, as I need to go stop a student from accidentally killing us all. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed.